We simply cannot allow people to pour into the United States undetected, undocumented, unchecked. And complete the dang fence. This bill that we will sign today is not a revolutionary bill. Cast down your bucket where you are. We come from France. And I am, you know, adamantly against illegal immigrants. They're coming in by the thousands. Just unbelievable. A Deal. wall is an immorality. What are you rooting for? Those masters of the universe are at it again. You maniac! You blew it up! Welcome to Parsing Immigration Policy, the weekly podcast of the Center for Immigration Studies, which is the most interesting place to go for timely analysis and commentary on the immigration issue. I'm Jessica Vaughn, Director of Policy Studies at the Center, subbing for Mark Krikorian. This week, we are continuing our focus on human trafficking. Since January is National Human Trafficking Prevention Month, and since human trafficking has become a much bigger problem due to the Biden border crisis. In December, the Center co-sponsored our second annual conference on combating human trafficking, together with the University of Houston's Border and Trade Institute. A lot of the discussion this year was about how states can respond to this new level of border-related human trafficking. My guest today is one of the speakers from the conference, Frank Russo. Frank is the Associate General Counsel of the Conservative Political Action Coalition, CPAC and he is the director of the CPAC Foundation's Center for Combating Human Trafficking. He has a great deal of experience drafting and passing public safety and criminal justice legislation over the years, and is now involved in helping states update their human trafficking laws. Frank, thanks for joining us. Jessica, it is an absolute pleasure to be here, and thank you all for being willing to partner with us. It's a real excitement on our end to be a part of the great work that you are already doing and to really build on the the models of success that you have really started and and led the way on for years. Oh, well, thank you. Well, there's a lot of work to be done these days, considering what has been happening at the border. And, you know, obviously human trafficking has been around forever. And of course, it's illegal and has been so for a long time. So first of all, why do states need to have effective laws addressing human trafficking? It's a great question. And I think it's one that uh, Folks who understand the human trafficking issue through border and what they see on the news don't seem to understand as much that it's really a local and and, and state problem more so than it is a federal problem. Of course, human trafficking, sex labor is the second largest and most profitable criminal activity in the country. And and unfortunately, we know that over 17,000 individuals are trafficked into the United States each year. But I think what a lot of people don't understand is that over 90% of the crime in this country is handled at the state and local level. State and local prosecutors, police, sheriffs are really the ones responsible for responding to these incidents and these crimes as they occur on a daily basis. So it's the focus of our work at CPAC and really all of the organizations and advocates in this space to make sure that those frontline officers and prosecutors are prepared and have the tools necessary to respond to these crimes in real time. So I think when you ask why is it a state and local issue, maybe even more so than a federal issue, it's because that's where the, unfortunately, the action is happening. Well, what exactly is lacking in state laws? I think that's important to understand why this is such an important issue area for us, is really that there are state attorney generals and state prosecutors who come at this issue, I think, unfortunately, and and frame it through some of the more basic criminal offenses. So states really lack a comprehensive criminal and civil code to go after these individuals under the broad brush of human trafficking criminal offenses. Essentially, what we see in states is that they don't have the crimes on the book that allow prosecutors and state police to know what they're specifically looking for to charge a human trafficking offense. So what does that mean? Unfortunately, it means that they're bringing other criminal charges. It's good that they're taking these cases seriously, but what they're not doing is bringing the actual offense of human trafficking. And the consequences of that can be dire. First, it creates a problem of data where we're not able to see what the real trafficking numbers are. Yes, I have noticed that a lot, that it's really hard to document the extent of this crime. And if you talk to prosecutors, what they'll tell you is it's not from a lack of interest or a lack of knowledge, but the reality is many of these human trafficking codes that exist, you know, frankly, in not a majority of states, but at least some states, are newer, don't have a significant case law body 
So they don't know how judges are going to handle it or what the evidentiary thresholds need to be met are. So they're more comfortable going with something like kidnapping or assault rather than taking that more complex offense to trial. Unfortunately, like you said, that data then gets lost in the shuffle. And these victims are not treated in a way that maybe they need to be as specifically victims of trafficking, not just those preliminary criminal offenses that you and I think of when we talk about the basics of criminal law. Yeah. And it, it, it may cut off some lines of inquiry that would be relevant to helping the feds then address some of these cross-border conspiracies or relationships that are fueling some of this nowadays, especially. Right. You're getting at the root of the problem, which is these are sophisticated criminal organizations engaging in trafficking, whether it be buying individuals who are already in the United States or bringing, unfortunately, children and adults into the country unlawfully to be trafficked for either sex or labor. These are sophisticated criminal organizations that a state police officer or local prosecutor doesn't have the resources to go after at a broader sense. However, if they are able to build their local case and through that, get the support of victims, get the support of the community to learn about who those individuals are in their jurisdiction, that helps their federal partners and their state attorney general partners to put those pieces of the puzzle back together and actually define who that criminal organization is, where they're operating, and how they're exploiting those open borders. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is a thing that's come up often this year and last year at our conference is the need for information sharing between the advocacy and victim support networks and law enforcement. That's a whole nother issue, but it, it is important. I think there's a lot of room for improvement there and trust building to help actually go after the people who are doing the trafficking as well as supporting the the victims and survivors. Well, I think that has to be a part of any state law. So I think going back to your question, what's lacking, one of the other big pieces of this is it's not just the criminal offense itself. It's the other pieces of a law that require cross-coordination and communication and maybe even direct data sharing between someone like a victim advocacy organization that's intaking those survivors and that local law enforcement unit that's focused on the actual criminal. I try to explain it's not for malintent. There's nobody here who's operating who doesn't want to end trafficking or doesn't believe that this is a sophisticated problem. The issue is the advocate organization is focused on that survivor. The law enforcement is focused on that offender. And obviously the prosecution or even at the state and federal level, the state attorney general or the Department of Justice are focused on that larger criminal conspiracy. So everyone has their lane and that's great. The problem is when they operate only in their own lane, they fail to really share and see the bigger picture. And unfortunately, that's led to a lot of the problems we've had in actually identifying who's really behind this focus on pushing individuals into this country across the border into a life of trafficking. Yeah. And then when you add in the immigration issue and a narrative that has been out there that ICE and its partner agencies are, you know, insensitive to the needs of victims and that, you know, their only interest is in booting people out of the country, you know, when in fact there are tools that can be used on behalf of the victims and, you know, their their interest is in combating human trafficking to prevent victimization, it just becomes a, you know, sometimes a difficult mix to navigate for some of these agencies, but but should be addressed. It should be. And I it's a great point. Just and simply, I'll say this, you know, victims don't want to be in this lifestyle and law enforcement doesn't want to find them in this lifestyle. So presenting an opportunity for them to, to succeed and thrive is in law enforcement's you know, minds. The problem is that law enforcement also has a criminal offender who's continuing to traffic individuals that they haven't yeah. yet identified. So they've got to be able to do their jobs and do so in a way that, that doesn't compromise public safety. Can you describe for us the model legislation that you've been working on and how this would be helpful? Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because we've already touched on so many of the elements of what we look for in any state legislation. And one of the goals of our organization is really to present states with options on how they can move forward and improve their not just criminal code, but their approach in general to human trafficking. So I'll give you an example. Down in the Southeast, one of the things that we've done in a lot of states is essentially present them with a four-point plan in human trafficking legislation. And that draft plan includes two key elements that I think 
aren't often thought of when it comes to writing a criminal code, but are really common sense when you think about the crime of human trafficking. So really what we did is we talked to victims and we found that a lot of victims were not just coerced into the types of sex or labor trafficking you would think of, whether that be prostitution or unlawful product creation, but what they were also enticed to do was commit other crimes, whether that be robbery, assault, many of the other pieces of criminal organizations that you think drug possession or drug sale. And so that coercion was at the heart, as it is with every trafficking offense, of what we were worried about. So what did we want to do? We wanted to take the existing criminal statutes, the things that law enforcement are comfortable with, kidnapping, assault, robbery, drug possession and distribution, and say, if you coerce another individual into committing those offenses, and we can prove that as the state, then we can include enhancements on penalties for you as an individual. So we're not just charging you with the human trafficking offense. We're not just charging you with the kidnapping, but we're also charging you with that coercion piece that you are forcing other individuals who otherwise would act innocently into committing crimes. And then there's the turn side of that coin that I think is so important because without cooperation from victims, these cases are incredibly hard to make. So what have we done with that? We've said, if you can prove as a victim by clear and convincing evidence, a high bar, that you were coerced into committing crimes, then what we'll do is we'll offer you an alternative to just simply incarceration. Doesn't mean we're not going to put you into a program to make sure you succeed. You can't put these survivors just back onto the street without resources, something that you and I both know and have worked on. But we'll offer you diversion programming or an opportunity to get into a safe house and to rebuild your life simply for really two things proving that you were a victim and assisting with that larger criminal case as appropriate. And so what we want to do is we want to up those punishments and enhance those penalties on the individuals who are committing those crimes and trafficking these individuals. And we want to provide a safe pathway for victims to assist that they are able to reintegrate into society, but also help us build our case and put that puzzle back together. Mm -hmm. And what has been the reaction of some of the survivor advocacy groups on some of these points? You, I mean, it seems very logical and, you know, it's hard for me sitting here to imagine what wouldn't work there. Like, why would you object to that? Well, I, I, I come bearing good news, I think, for once, which is a lot of these advocate organizations are supportive of this effort. They okay. want to see that pathway to victims. What they'll often... And this isn't surprising because it's such a wonky policy fight is an argument over what are those legal standards or terms of art mean. When I say clear and convincing, that is a high bar and that's on purpose because we don't want a world where traffickers start to claim that they're victims. Right. Which we've seen a lot of. You would be surprised in the immigration context what people will try to claim to try, you know, to get asylum or what have you. Right. We don't want to use the tools or our tools for law enforcement to become the tools of traffickers. Right. And I think that is so valuable to this movement that we ensure that victims have a pathway out, but we need to prove that. There's the trust, but verify. And that's the reality of this space as it is in everywhere else in the criminal justice world. And, you know, we've seen in visa programs that were set up with all the best intentions to help out victims of trafficking or victims of crime or victims of spousal abuse to give them an an immigration benefit so that there shouldn't be any hesitancy to cooperate with law enforcement agencies, we've seen these programs become completely corrupted and abused and inundated with frivolous cases where, uh, you know, you have criminals claiming to be victims and so on just to get the visa benefit because there's so little control and oversight and so such a low bar for establishing eligibility that they actually end up preventing the the real meritorious cases from getting the visa benefit because they have to wait in line behind all these, you know, people abusing the program. So you have to have a high standard for establishing that. There's no question. You're 100% right and it's, you know, it's un- it's the unfortunate reality that not just in the border context but the criminal justice space is seeing coming out of the pandemic years, which is there are a significant number of caseloads across all of the different criminal subsets. And there are, and I don't, this won't be news to anybody listening to this, a, you know, multitude of police forces that are missing officers. There are prosecutors' offices that are down prosecutors. And frankly, there are public defense and private defense attorneys who are going back into other spaces of the law. So you have a, you have a deficit across the criminal justice system. And so if we're creating a pathway to clog the courts with frivolous claims of victimization, we don't want that. We want as the true 
individuals, these survivors who have overcome so much pain and suffering to be put at the front of the line, not the back of the line. Absolutely. And if we allow there to be this exploitation, which we have seen in other spaces, that would be my plea to advocates to understand that the reason we put in high legal bars to proving that second element of these state laws is to ensure that the folks that you are serving get to the front of that line. Okay. Are there any states in particular that are doing an especially good job of managing this and updating their statutes and, you know, finding a pathway to making a difference on this? Absolutely. And there, it's interesting because I will say, you know, no one has the, the silver bullet for this problem, but the states who are focusing on some of the elements we've already talked about are really bringing, you know, to bear the successes that we hope to see. So we were just in Texas, and I think Texas has done a fantastic job of trying to marry not just the state and local prosecution, but also what their state attorney's general's office is doing with those two elements, which is supporting survivors and going harder after the actual criminals themselves. So in their state, they've passed laws to allow those survivors not just to receive some form of diversion, but also to look at clearing their records so that once they do get through that case process, do assist law enforcement, the key elements we're looking for, that we also don't stick them with a criminal record that ends up holding them back in their lives. That's a great example of how you reward the cooperation, especially on the back end once it's already occurred, rather than rewarding it before it occurs, as you've kind of mentioned. You know, the couple other ones that I'll mention that we've been active in are Florida, Arkansas, and Missouri. And, and, And I think it's important to look at what the general trends are amongst those three states. The first is their state attorney generals and their governor's office have set up multi-agency task force similar to those in Texas to ensure that there is better coordination from the top down to the state and local and even the municipal law enforcement that are seeing these issues on the first and front end. When a state and local law enforcement officer, as we talked about, deals with you know a victim for the first time, they have to realize, where am I going to place this victim? Is this criminal I've now arrested part of a broader network or are they operating independently or with a smaller group? Well, hopefully the state resources that are broader can help answer and fill in those gaps for those state and local officers and prosecutors engaging in this activity. So Florida's done a fantastic job of this with an agency that's actually, interestingly enough, independent from the state governor or state attorney general's office, but works in concert with them coordinating across the state. Mm. In Arkansas and Missouri, they've recently started task forces. So they've really jumped on this trend you know, here in the last couple of years and focused their work this will get a little bit too in the legal weeds, but I think it's important for listeners to understand that you know jurisdiction is important in this, meaning that state and local prosecutors in some state handle all of the criminal elements of these you know these trafficking offenses. In other states, the the traffickers can be prosecuted at the state attorney general level. Well, in mm-hmm. Arkansas and Missouri, they don't want that to become a problem. They don't want those jurisdictional challenges to be an issue. Missouri, there all of the jurisdiction lies with those local prosecutors. So the state attorney general is simply appointing individuals to help coordinate those efforts. So when someone gets picked up in County A, prosecutor in County B is able to assist in knowing if that victim lives in their county or that criminal resides in their county, they can assist with the case and they can help bring, you know, hopefully the fruits of putting down the larger criminal organization statewide. So the state attorney general's office simply helps them coordinate amongst themselves. Similar in Arkansas. And then Arkansas is really going to be focused, you know, as they move into their sessions in the coming years on how do they go after those coercion elements we've discussed. They've been the state most interested in bringing to bear, and their advocates on both the survivor and the law enforcement side have just been fantastic in understanding there is two sides to that coin. We want to make sure that the victims have those proper incentives to work with law enforcement. And then the last state you know, that I, I didn't bring up earlier, but I think is so valuable to the conversation is Georgia. And, and I'm a little biased here. I'm a Georgian myself. I'm mm-hmm. licensed to practice law down there. And so I would be uh, remiss not to give them a quick shout out, which is their attorney general uh, has done a fantastic job of creating a new human trafficking task force that does have jurisdiction to prosecute, but making sure that they're not stepping on the toes of prosecutors and the state and local space. What does that mean? That means when they come in, rather than saying, we're going to take your case or we're going to force you out of this investigation, what they do is they actually make sure that the state and local prosecutor is a part of that investigation. And they make sure that there is an agreement on who should be bringing charges and where. And then there's a coordination on what to do with the victims themselves and how to support them best. So that actually was done without a state law. But what I'm starting to see in my home state of Georgia is that the state legislature is now playing catch up in a good way 
and saying, all right, what are the gaps that you're seeing, State AG? What are you seeing, prosecutor in Gwinnett or Fulton County that, that you don't have? And so I know that this year they're focused on uh, looking at passing some laws that incentivize victims to work closer with law enforcement. And I think that's generally a good thing. Yes, that that is hopeful. Now, with respect to border-related human trafficking, what the numbers that are out there show is that while trafficking for commercial sex, most of that involves Americans, American victims, American offenders, forced labor trafficking, on the other hand, seems to be much more of a border related problem that that the majority of the victims of forced labor trafficking are not citizens and i'm working on you know looking at who the offenders are as well in these cases and so this is a problem that is exacerbated by an insecure border and by a lack of immigration enforcement and this is where we have seen a lot of the child exploitation with the influx of unaccompanied minors and how they end up in exploitative labor situations. Other than doing a better job of controlling the border, which you know, would, would be the most helpful thing, are there things that states can do to try to address the issue of forced labor trafficking that you've worked on or seen as successful? It's such an important issue because unfortunately, labor isn't where folks' minds go when they think of trafficking, right? It's all the sex trafficking, which is, of course, important. But unfortunately, the, the rise of labor trafficking in the United States has been beyond expansive. And frankly, you yeah. here at the Center for Immigration Studies have done the best job of capturing that picture and really sharing that message with the public. And we're just thankful that, that we're not alone in understanding that it's a problem and it's expanding, you know, unfortunately, daily. I'll, I'll give you an, a near border example. So in Oklahoma, as we talked about down in, when we were in Texas, that state has recently seen a growth in labor trafficking issues around their marijuana and CBD grows. It's a new initiative in the state that allows those farms and grows to exist. And yet the state regulatory agency is often not well equipped to see where those worker exploitation pieces are taking place. Oh, yeah. This is getting to be huge in not only Oklahoma, but a bunch of other states. Yeah, go on, please. Right. And I, and I think California, Colorado, we, we can keep going. But the reality is when you have a new area that is lightly regulated or, or simply behind the eight ball when it comes to regulation and doesn't have the bodies or the manpower, it's simply an opening for these traffickers, right? They, they see this mm-hmm. and they view it as an opportunity to push a lot of these unaccompanied minors and other individuals who essentially they feel owe a debt to them into this yes. line of work. So what are we doing about it? There's the policy solution, which is obviously the legislation, but there's also a, an education, even from an executive standpoint solution. In Oklahoma, you know, that problem was brought to us by the state and local law enforcement operating in some of the more rural parts of the state who said, we don't have a, a robust regulatory agency. I'm a sheriff's office that's, you know, three to four deputies. And I know that this grow that we may want to bust has over 50 to 100 individuals who, who speak non-native languages. Well, well, that creates a significant problem, right? Who's going to communicate? Where are they going to place these victims? And how are they going to solve this problem? in a way that doesn't completely shut down the local law enforcement, who, by the way, also has to keep the rest of the community safe. And that's the part that folks don't think about. So what we've said is it starts at the top. The governors have to, and their state attorney generals, have to put in robust and hire staff to regulate these industries where we see the most exploitive workers. The easiest one, obviously, is farming or grows. But mm-hmm. any, any industry, whether it be the hotel or the farming being the two most obvious, needs to have robust regulatory agencies. Poultry processing. And, and apparently we need right. this in, in Cheerios factories and auto parts fa- manufacturers as well. And it's so hard because the public doesn't want to think that they get up, they, they eat a bowl of cereal, they get in their car and they drive to work. And every element of that step to start their day was affected by trafficking. But you and I both know that it is. Yes, absolutely. And people don't think about it. And our government has done a lot, especially under the Biden administration, to talk about trafficked labor in other countries, but unfortunately, very little to publicize or or really go after these cases inside the United States. Right. And it's the broader problem in the trafficking space, which is many Americans feel this as a part of problem that happens in third world countries or overseas or somewhere else. No, 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 no. This is happening in your community. Yeah. 
Absolutely. People don't want to patronize these establishments, you know, if they knew. Right. And I don't think Americans would. That's, that's the best part about this. I saw a Gallup poll recently that over 80% of Americans know that trafficking is a growing problem. The question is, do they know it's a growing problem in this country? And that's what these type of initiatives, these type of conversations are so important. And to go back to what you said about state legislation, what are we thinking? Well, the criminal piece is important. Obviously, <laughs> indebting someone into labor is a crime. It's actually a RICO predicate in every state and at the federal level. So you can engage in a broader criminal investigation. But there's a civil portion of this too. These companies operate understandably as we want them to from a profit-driven mindset. Well, we need to hit the companies that are engaging or allowing this traffic to occur on their premises right. where it hurts, and that's in the profits. And so there are some states, and I know that through the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, there are ways for federal agencies who hand out contracts or grants to penalize companies who engage in either reckless or conscious disregard of the fact that trafficking is occurring on their property. But we need to expand that effort. State attorney generals need to combine their efforts, Republican or Democrat, to focus on what are the standards we need to put in place or our state legislatures need to put in place. It could be that reckless disregard to allow us tomorrow to when we discover that a facility has these individuals being illegally trafficked in them, the next day they're in court dealing with civil penalties and the mm. potential for civil pain, essentially. And so that has been our focus when we talk to these state agencies, these state lawmakers, and these governors. You need to have a structure in place that doesn't just require criminal elements or criminal law enforcement to get involved or engaged. You need to have the ability for your regulatory agencies to hit them with penalties quickly. I like it. And there's this other element that I've observed over the years, and it happens both with illegal labor and people who are coming in on work visa programs is this increasing reliance on labor contractors to do the hiring. And in that way, employers have been able sometimes to shield themselves from liability for either illegal hiring or, you know, avoiding taxes or avoiding responsibility for the obvious trafficking of labor, even involving children, that is occurring within their facility. And I think we need to find a way to address that as well. I couldn't agree more. And, and doesn't that sound reckless to you? It needs to also yes. sound reckless to the courts, right? If reckless disregards the standard, there should be no way to put up a legal shield between creating a contractor that's allowing this trafficking in your facilities and your actual culpability for it. It sounds certainly like reckless disregard for me. And if I'm a state attorney general uh, or a state legislature, frankly, it's very easy to write in your laws that that does not create an immunity from that standard. Yes. Yes. Well, there's another actor in some of these trafficking schemes that is apparent, and that is the role of social media applications that are used by the traffickers and some other technology-based tools that they use to snare victims and also, of course, to to sell their illicit services. And I think it's important to talk about what can be done to address the social media angle and these platforms and how to somehow get them to do the right thing and not be witting or unwitting actors in this horrific trade. It's a fantastic question. And it brings me back, you know, at the front, I said there were four elements to every legislative proposal we think about even at the state level. And we've touched on obviously the, the traffickers themselves, the victims and the labor angle. This is the maybe the most important emerging area that needs to be addressed, yes, by state legislatures. And often they don't think they have a role to play. Well, you've done such a good job of defining the problem, which is all of these social media apps and, and the rise of new apps that are more peer-to-peer, -peer, whether that, that be some of the, the Signal and WhatsApps that are out there, or even the OnlyFans content that, that goes cr directly from creator to consumer. The real fear is that has created a new avenue that is being exploited by traffickers that allows them to capture their victims in their homes and then allow those victims to be forced to engage in illegal acts outwardly direct to consumer. That's the newest change. This doesn't require movement of the victim. It doesn't require paying for a hotel room or forcing somebody to move or somebody to evade. This is coming directly into children's 
and sometimes adults' bedrooms. And that's the scary part. It's very the scary. good news is there are steps that can be taken, right? And I think we've seen some of this, and states have been a leader oftentimes where the federal government's fallen behind. In Missouri, uh, I've mentioned the attorney general's office there and the great work they've done. They've joined a partner in New Mexico, so I, I like to highlight the bipartisan nature for once of this issue, which is so important, mm-hmm. in suing these tech companies and exposing, for example, that our friends at Meta, who operate Facebook and Instagram as maybe their most notable products, were engaging in considering limiting the encryption. So we don't need to go down the end of, of what encryption really is, but essentially blinding themselves as a company from the chats that operate on their kids' platforms, on Facebook for kids and Instagram for kids. Well, without that lawsuit exposing that, Meta may have moved forward with essentially shielding themselves from having to see what's happening in those chats. Thankfully, they've taken a step back. So sunlight is the best first disinfectant in this space. Yes. But, but I'll say, and, and you talked on the border piece, right? There's more to this accountability angle. And I think it has to start with what are their internal policies? And can we even get our hands on those, right? Yeah, yeah. But you're right. And that's part of the sunshine that needs to be cast on these companies and on the activities that they are facilitating. One of the, the, the biggest pieces of this that I think it, the public should know more about is what happens when law enforcement does engage in an investigation where they identify a victim on one of these social media apps and they identify a perpetrator. Well, like any other company, they're served with lawful process. There are understandably strong arguments when it comes to protection of your Fourth Amendment rights and your privacy, both in data and personal. And obviously, we don't want any of those things to be violated. And these companies, I think sometimes to their great credit, do think about those pieces when they're they're setting up their platforms and their community guidelines. Unfortunately, where they fall short is when it comes to the actual legal process that law enforcement provides them. So let's say I'm an officer or an agency and I, I reach out to these law enforcement departments. One of the most frustrating elements that you'll hear from the ground is that these platforms will create portals that require specific terms to be used. Essentially, they treat the law enforcement as if they don't really know what's happening in these cases or on their platforms. And what they'll do over time is they'll change those terms. So law enforcement's warrant that may be submitted six months prior may no longer be eligible to be reviewed by Facebook or Google or Microsoft six months down the road. How does that make sense? Yeah. The facts of the case didn't change. Moving the goalposts, redefining things. Mm. Right. That's where I start to worry that it's malicious intent from these companies. And I think they can do a better job and have a a social and, and frankly, legal responsibility to do so. There are countless cases, if you talk to victim advocates, of where a victim can identify, you know, underage inappropriate material on a platform that was placed against their will because they were trafficked, that they have to fight for months and sometimes years to get off of these platforms. Mm. What benefit to their community uh, online does it pose to keep those those things up? I I just don't understand. Right. If if anything should be removed, that's the kind of thing that there should be no discussion about even. Right. And, and this, these companies will say, and, and I'm, I'm grateful that they are seriously considering taking more steps, but I will repeat this line until I'm blue in the face, which is there should be more staff, people, not AI, which is a good tool, not their existing community guidelines, but actual physical human beings focused on the law enforcement and rooting out criminal trafficking and sex trafficking and abuse on those platforms than there are for any other type of content moderation. Mm. And frankly, I don't think that's been the case. No, no. Well, this has been so interesting and informative. Is there anything else that we should have touched on but didn't or that you'd like to add before we wrap it up? Well, first, I'll say thank you so much for for the opportunity to join. And I'm just grateful for the work that your organization is doing to to really, like we said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And I always always end with, you know, a call to action, not just to, to the folks who may listen and the the community advocates, but also to the law enforcement and to the state agencies and to the governors and the attorney generals. Right now, only 13 states have a statewide multi-agency trafficking task force. Only 27 states allow victims to receive financial restitutions from their traffickers. And only 22 states offer diversion programs to help their victims reintegrate into society. To me, those are problems that are solvable tomorrow. So this fight, as every fight does in this space, takes all of us 
And I know we can do more to help the work that you all are doing to solve the immigration problems we see on a daily basis. Count us in. We're just grateful to be a part of this team. Well, thank you. Those numbers are really surprising, actually. I thought they would be higher. But thank you so much for your work on this issue, Frank. And please tell us, where can our listeners go to learn more about your work? Absolutely. You can find us at cpac.org. Right at the top of the page, you'll see our foundation and our foundation website, which you'll find then the CPAC Foundation's CPAC Center for Combating Human Trafficking. And I am on Twitter or X, which is now formerly Twitter, at F Russo, uh, F R U S S O 1 5. Great. Thank you so much, Frank. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And that's it for this week's edition of Parsing Immigration Policy. I'm Jessica Vaughn, and I hope you'll check out the show notes and other material on our website and on the CPAC website about border-related human trafficking and the whole range of immigration issues. And please leave us some feedback on the show. Thank you for listening. 